Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming to today's talk of interdisciplinary studies. I'm Amina, and we are very happy to have Dr. Captain Lass here to deliver her talk entitled Travel, Migration, and Cross-Cultural Unconscious in 19th and Early 20th Century China. Dr. Captain Lass received her Bachelor and Master degrees at the University of York, majoring in history. She pursued her PhD study at the University of Basco under the supervision of the internationally renowned scholar Professor Robin Speakers. After receiving her PhD in 2007, Dr. Lass taught as collaborator in State University from 2008 to 2012. In 2012, she joined the Hong Kong Baptist University as assistant professor in history. Also, she was the winner of the 2013 to 2014 Hong Kong Academia of Humanities First Book Prize. Dr. Lass is a Anagata scholar who specialized in the social, cultural, and political history of colonialism the Chinese Treaty Ports, Global History, Asia-Europe Relations from the 19th century to the first half of the 20th century, and history of its various communities. Now I shall pass the time to Dr. Lass. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yatlo, for that very nice introduction. And thank you to the members of the audience for coming out here on this hot and rainy Saturday afternoon to listen to this lecture. Today I want to give a human history of the Treaty Court era. I want to give an idea of the very wide range of people for whom Treaty Court China spoke of opportunity. And in particular, I'm going to focus on settlers, sojourners, and migrants in the Treaty Court considering their lives and experiences in China, the journeys that they made to get to China, and the reasons behind those journeys. And hopefully the examples that I'm going to give today will show that many of these so-called foreigners on the China coast were not really foreign to China at all. Instead, their lives were very deeply embedded in the cultural, political, and professional environment of the China coast. So I want to present an alternative history of the Treaty Port era, the time when China's major coastal and riverine ports were subject to an unprecedented degree of economic, political, and cultural influence from foreign powers. And when we learn about China's semi-colonial century, the focus tends to be first and foremost on the political and the military and the economic aspects of this history. And in many ways this makes sense. These aspects of the Treaty Port era are very important. And this era was initiated by the two intertwined forces of trade and of conflict. The conflicts between China and the West in the mid-19th century are credited with bringing about a seismic change in China's relations with the West and in hastening, hastening the decline of the imperial system in China. And of course, the consequences of these conflicts in the mid-19th century and the subsequent wars that followed over the course of the 19th century was the so-called unequal treaty system, which established the terms of China's relations with the foreign powers. And just to name a few of those terms, extraterritoriality, of course, was very important. The clause by which foreigners in China were subject to the legal systems of their home countries rather than the Chinese legal system. Uh, there were favorable terms set for international trade, foreign control of major institutions, such as the Chinese Maritime Customs Service, was established in this time period. And China was also opened up to an unprecedented degree of cultural influence from the West, particularly religious influence. But 
more than anything, I think that the conflicts between China and the West in the 19th century incorporated China into a world of expanding European empires. And this was a very unequal world, but also a globalizing world, an ever thickening web of international connections began to crisscross the globe. And through these pathways moved goods and capital, ideas and ideologies, and crucially, people. And it's these people who traveled to and who lived in China, and the way that they shaped and the way they negotiated treaty port environments that I want to talk about today. The treaties, of course, opened up many ports in China to foreign trade and residents. And this means that China's semi-colonial century was a human story as much as it was a political story or a military story or an economic story. And in fact, very ordinary people shaped the environment of the China coast in important ways. I'm going to tell three different stories today, uh, the life stories of three different individuals who I think can tell us important things about this world of the China coast. Now, the first person is an adventurer in the late 19th century. The second person is a fraudster or a petty criminal. And the third person I want to talk about is a collaborator, a person who collaborated with the Japanese puppet regimes in the 20th century. And together, I think that these different stories demonstrate several things. First of all, I think they highlight the very complicated identities of foreigners on the China coast during this era. And when we tend to think about foreign communities in China in the 20th century, in the late 19th century, we tend to think first and foremost about the elite members of this society, the taikans, the, the heads of uh, big foreign trading houses who amassed a great deal of wealth and power and status from moving to China. And the history of these people is important, of course, but there's also a more hidden world, a world of people who were much more marginal, people who performed more menial or manual work, people who had a low status and often a low education. So people such as this man, William Ferguson, who was a light keeper in the Chinese Maritime Customs Service, which meant that he operated the lighthouses on the China coast. And he's pictured here with his family in this very charming photograph. Uh, this world is a world that's not often talked about. Now, secondly, I think that these three stories, they also emphasize mobility. They emphasize the journeys that many people made to get to China and how China was incorporated into this expanding network of connections, connections of travel and migration that spread across the empire world. And lastly, I think that all of these three stories they highlight how people's personal and private lives could very quickly become political and gain a political significance in this charged environment of the treaty ports. So on to the three life stories then. The first and the earliest story that I want to tell is the story of an adventurer. And this adventurer is Charles Welsh Mason, who claimed that he was involved in a secret society plot to overthrow the Chinese government in 1891. So the story, or its discovery, begins on the night of the 13th of September in 1891, when Charles Mason, who was a clerk in the Chinese Customs Service, a would-be adventurer and also a bit of a fantasist. He disembarked in the Yangtze River port of Zhenjiang, carrying a pair of Derringer pistols 
and also five pounds of dynamite. Now, according to a memoir that he wrote later, Mason had these weapons because he was aiming to lead a rebellion to overthrow the Qing dynasty and probably in a flourish that was designed to appeal to his British readers, he claimed that the aim of this rebellion was to make himself the king of China. Now, unfortunately for Mason's plan, two of his colleagues in the Chinese Maritime Customs Service, which had been tipped off about the conspiracy, were waiting for him when he got off the boat and they arrested him. Now, in the late summer of 1891, the discovery of this illicit cargo of the dynamite and the Derringer pistols, this was particularly troubling for foreign communities because for months, anti-foreign riots that were directed principally at missionaries and also their Christian converts had been erupting in the lower Yangtze Valley. And this had left foreign communities in the region in a state of high tension. Uh, just as an example, this is, this is an example of some of the uh, anti-Christian propaganda that had been circulating in the valley in the lead up to the summer of 1891. And this one shows Catholics apparently gouging out the eyes of their Christian converts. Now, in order to protect British subjects who lived in the treaty ports, Britain had sent a gunboat, the HMS Red Pole, to Zhenjiang in order to patrol the river and ostensibly to protect foreign communities. And this was quite convenient because when Mason was arrested, uh, he, this, this gunboat formed a temporary prison for him, so he was placed on board the gunboat. Now, sensationally, when he was questioned, Mason claimed that the dynamite was intended for use in these very disturbances, in these anti-foreign uprisings. And more than that, he claimed that it was part of a secret society plot to overthrow the provincial government. So already we have quite an interesting story where we have, first of all, a British man and an employee of the Chinese Maritime Customs Service, a Chinese state organization, who is claiming to be involved in a rebellion that is anti-foreign and also anti-Qing. But when we, when we dig deeper into the story and the, the backstory behind the events of 1891, the plot thickens further. It becomes very unclear as to whether the secret society rebellion was real or whether it was simply a figment of Mason's very colorful imagination. So I want to just go back a few months, uh, before, a few years uh, in time to think about why Mason came to China and why he might have, have invented this secret society plot. We know that Mason came to China in 1887, four years before this event, and he moved there to become an administrator in the Chinese Maritime Customs Service, which at this point in time was controlled by the Foreign Inspector General, Sir Robert Hart. China and the Customs Service, they were still quite unusual destinations for middle-class British men who were looking for a career overseas. But the director of the Customs Service, Robert Park, was he was really trying to market the Customs Service as being a good overseas career opportunity that was very similar to colonial civil services, such as the Indian Civil Service. And Mason had taken this opportunity. Now, when he arrived in China, he was stationed to the port of Zhenjiang, which is a couple of hundred miles down the Yangtze River from Shanghai. And it probably wasn't quite what he had in mind when he imagined going to China. It was a relatively small port with a small foreign community, very, very different from the glamorous image of Shanghai that people often think about when they think about the treaty ports. And so he quickly became very bored in this environment. 
which may be one of the reasons why he invented the secret society plot in 1891. In the summer of 1891, he began to actually talk about his involvement in the secret society to some of his colleagues in the customs service, and he actually tried to recruit some of them to join his uprising. In particular, he tried to recruit his Chinese teacher to join the uprising. All members of the customs service in the 19th century, they were assigned a Chinese teacher in order to help them with their work. Um, but this, his teacher declined, declined the offer of joining the secret society very sensibly. Also, his boss in the customs service, the commissioner, discovered a notebook in which Mason had written an outline of the plot in a secret code. But despite all of this evidence, the customs service did nothing to try and stop Mason. Instead, they just assigned one of his colleagues to act as a spy and to keep track of his actions and his activities. In August of 1891, Mason decided to take action and he took some leave from his job and traveled to Hong Kong. And once he got to Hong Kong, he, the first thing he did was he bought a disguise. So he bought a false beard, and glasses and a false nose and he put on his disguise and then he went to a weapon shop and he placed an order for a very very large supply of weapons which included 100 Winchesters, uh, 20 Martini Henry rifles and 221 bayonets and 127 revolvers and he bought this with his own money with $3,600 of his own money he packed them all up and sent them to Shanghai, uh, purportedly for the rebellion that he was planning. And then after he arranged for this shipment, the next thing he did was he went to a boarding house and he recruited 20 out-of-work foreign sailors to uh, help him in the rebellion as mercenaries. And the ringleader of these sailors was a French-Canadian man who had previously worked as a policeman in the Shanghai Municipal Police. So these men, they were supposed to be the vanguard of the uprising, and they were supposed to accompany Mason to Shanghai. But Mason's plan begins to unravel here, because many of these sailors who he had recruited, they began to get very suspicious about his motives, and many of them dropped out of the plan, which meant that only five of them actually traveled to Shanghai. The shipment of arms was intercepted in Shanghai, and when Mason traveled there two days later, he was arrested as he got off the boat. So this is, I think, an interesting story in and of itself, but one of the aspects of this story that I want to highlight is that it sparked a very serious diplomatic incident between Britain and the Chinese government. Now, from the British consular authorities' perspective, they didn't believe that the plot existed. Uh, the British consul in Shanghai said that this was just a figment of Mason's imagination. It was just a hallucination, as he put it. And that they, they insinuated that Mason was probably mentally ill, and that's why he came up with this idea of a secret society plot. But Chinese officials saw it very differently because to them it was just inconceivable that somebody would falsely claim to be involved in a secret society plot because the penalty for being involved in an uprising is very, very severe. So the Chinese authorities began to press the British authorities to arrest and to prosecute Mason. And even the regional viceroy got involved in this, in this pressure. And eventually the British authorities, they caved under this pressure and they arrested Mason just after he'd finished his breakfast and was leaving the dining room in his hotel. But crucially, they did not arrest him on charges of rebellion, but on the charge of possessing dynamite, which was illegal under British law. So there followed this very highly publicized 
trial in the British court in Shanghai. And during the trial, Mason was given an opportunity to grandstand to the audience, to the jury. And he claimed that he had just got involved in the secret society plot so that he could learn more about it and then foil the plot and inform the Chinese authorities. But nonetheless, he was sentenced to nine months in prison. And he served his time in the consular prison in Shanghai. But the story doesn't end there because the Chinese authorities were, they were very, very angry at the sentence because it was only nine months. And so they began to contest the sentence. There followed this, this onslaught of diplomatic correspondence sent by various Chinese officials to the British government, trying to push the British government into a retrial. And this is just one example. So this is a letter from the Chinese ambassador to Britain and France, who was stationed in London at the time. And this is just one of his many letters that he wrote to Lord Salisbury, who was the British Prime Minister at this point in time. And here he is. He's protesting about the, against the view that Mason was mentally ill, and that was why he invented the plot. Now, what's interesting about this correspondence is that one of the major arguments that is used is that extraterritoriality, the clause by which British people in China are tried under British law and in British courts, rather than under Chinese law, is not working. So the Chinese government uses this case as a pretext for trying to argue against extraterritoriality and to try to renegotiate the treaties with Britain. So why is this case important? Well, I think that one of the things that this shows is first of all that China is becoming quite integrated into some of the professional migration networks around the empire world. Mason travels to China in the first place for a job, for a job in the Chinese Customs Service. I think more than anything though, it shows that in this very tense political environment of the treaty port, where the boundary between foreign and Chinese authority is still being decided upon and negotiated, the actions of a relatively insignificant person can be used as an excuse, as a pretext, for renegotiating those treaties and renegotiating the limits of foreign power. So an incident that began as the fevered delusions in the imagination of an administrator in the small port on the Yangtze River, a place that most British people had never heard of, was now a matter of international diplomacy. And one other thing that I think is very important is that Mason, in his trial, named four people who were supposedly accomplices, who had taken part in this plot, four, four Chinese people that he knew from his work. And all four of them were placed on trial in Chinese courts and were executed, so they were killed as a result of his accusations. So again, the actions of a quite unimportant person could have very, very big consequences. There's a bit of an after story to the Mason plot because after he was released from prison and returned to Britain, he embarks upon a second career, a career as a writer. Between 1896 until 1900, Mason wrote five novels, five books, and all of these books were loosely based on his experiences in China. They were essentially adventure stories set in China. And his books, they had a moderate success. So he received very good reviews at the time and his books sold quite well. These are just two of them pictured here. They're not very good though, so I wouldn't recommend <laughs> looking them up and reading them. So this is um, important because 
When we think about Mason's actions in 1891 and how he tried to get involved in the secret society plot, how he bought a false disguise for himself and wrote letters in a secret code, uh, it's very similar to the plot lines of colonial adventure stories, of stories that were becoming bestsellers in Britain. Uh, what's possible is that he had read a lot of these adventure stories before he went to China. And when he went to China, he had expected his life to be something like this, uh, an adventure. He expected his experiences to be similar to famous colonial adventurers, such as the explorer of Africa, Henry Morton Stanley. But instead, his experiences were more like this. He was trapped at a desk all day long. He was a pen pusher. He didn't get paid very much. It was not a very exciting life. So he tried to compensate for this by inventing his own adventure. And then later on, he turned that attempt at an adventure into stories that he sold in his books. So Mason made lots of travels, lots of journeys in the course of his career. He began his life in the south of England, and then of course he made a big migration to China. He went back to Britain after that, but soon after he published his books, he decided to make another migration. He traveled to Canada, and in Canada he hoped to join the gold rush, but he only got as far as Toronto, so he failed at gold prospecting, just as he had failed at his career in the customs service. Uh, we know that he then made another move, and moved to New York, where he got married, and had some children, and worked as a journalist for a New York newspaper, but then in about 1910, he seems to have abandoned his family and moved to a log cabin in the countryside in upstate New York. And the last that we know about him is that he was working building roads, so as a roadman, in the north of America in about 1920. And he probably returned to Britain in 1922. So he made lots of journeys, but China really continued to shape his work and his experiences. Even though he had only lived in China for four years, it had this very profound impact upon his life, and his work, and his way of thinking. All of his books were based in China. And when he was in North America, so after he moved to Canada, and the United States, he wrote lots of articles and letters about how it was really boring in North America and he wished he could go back to China where there was a possibility of adventure. And then 35 years, or 34 years I should say, after the rebellion in 1891, he published a memoir about his experiences. So these China experiences continue to shape his life and I think this shows how China became quite deeply embedded, deeply entrenched in the British imagination as a place of potential excitement and potential adventure. So on to the second life story. And this is a story of a woman named Edith Brentnell. And she could also be described as an adventurer as such. In fact, lots of newspaper reports from the time of her life described her as an adventurer. I've described her here as a fraudster, but it's probably a little bit unfair because most of her criminal activities are born out of desperation and out of the difficult circumstances of her life. She's also a person who broke the rules of treaty court society and was considered to be an embarrassment by other members of the foreign community. But the similarities with Charles Mason end there. Rather than being a sojourner, a person who spent a short time in China, Edith Brentnell was born and bred 
on the China coast. So she was born in China and was therefore very deeply embedded in the social networks that spanned the Chinese and the Japanese treaty ports. And she's an example of the type of person who fell into a class of people who were destitute, a class of destitute foreigners um, who were considered to be beyond the pale of respectable treaty port society, who were largely without money and didn't have many skills that they could market to get jobs, and who therefore had to depend upon their wits, upon crime, or on strategic alliances in order to survive. And in the case of women like Edith Frenknell, those alliances often meant marriage alliances or relationships with men who could help them. So I have called Edith, Edith Brennell, but it's worth noting she went by many different names. So sometimes she used the name Dorothea and sometimes Magdalene. She also had a lot of second names. So there are various names that she is known by in the documents. I've called her Brennell here because this seems to be the one she used the most. But these are, I think it's an indication of just how flexible people's identities could be in the treaty courts. Record keeping was not very good in the treaty ports, and so it was easy to assume a different name. And lots of these names, these second names, are names that she gained from the various father figures in her life and from various men who she married or had relationships with later on. So let's start at the beginning with her birth. She was actually, she was born in Hong Kong in approximately 1893. I'm not sure exactly when she also changed her birth date quite a lot too. And her parents were probably unmarried, but we know that her father was a man named Bertie Grimble, who was from Newcastle on Tyne in England. But he doesn't seem to have stuck around for very long because quite soon after her birth, Edith's mother married a, a man named Brentnell who was also British, so this is why she, she mainly used this name, Brentnell. And then a bit later, her mother married a man named Detler, and he was an American, and so he registered Edith as his daughter at the American embassy. And later on, her mother also married a Danish man named Knudsen, who was working for Butterfield and Swire Company. Like many foreigners on the China coast who were born in China, she had a very limited education. So she had only been to school for five years and therefore didn't have very many skills that she could sell in order to get a job. And so in March of 1909, when she was still only 15 years old, she married a person named Frederick Mann. So this is where her first married name comes from. And there are some suggestions she was forced into this marriage by her mother who wanted to get rid of the responsibility of looking after her. And just a year later, in 1910, she gave birth to a daughter named Constance. So at this point, after her marriage, she moves with her husband, Frederick Mann, to Shanghai. And in Shanghai, Edith's husband, Frederick, starts working in a trading company called Grant and Rogers. And the partner in this company is William Grant. And William Grant, he lends Edith and her husband some money because they're in quite difficult financial straits. And he seems to have had some ulterior motives in lending this money to Edith and her husband because it seems that he had taken a shine to Edith and shortly afterwards, he sent her husband on business on a very long business trip to America. In fact, he never actually returned to China, so it was a permanent business trip. And after he sent her husband away, he moved in on Edith and told her that, according to Edith at least, that she had to become his mistress because of the debt that she owed him. Otherwise, he would take her to court over the debt. And so she lived with William Brandt in Shanghai for seven years. The Brandt family, it's, it's worth taking a little bit of a diversion here because the Brandt family was also very interesting. They were also a multi 
multi-generational China Coast family. So this is a rough family tree. It's actually a much more complicated family tree than this, so I put the basics on this slide. Um, they were a Eurasian family, so a mixed race family. The ancestors that we first know about are James Cleverly, a British man who moved to Hong Kong shortly after the British annexation of Hong Kong. And he either married or had children with an unknown Chinese woman in Hong Kong. We don't know her name, which is quite common. The, the spouses of British men are not recorded in the archives. And we know they had a daughter, Augusta Cleverly, who was born in around 1850 in Hong Kong. And she married a German merchant a German Hong Kong merchant, Oscar Brandt. And together they had eight children, although I've only listed six here. Um, and the children did quite well for themselves, uh, mostly. In fact, the daughter, Mary Brandt, married Lord John Campbell Heathcote, so a member of the British aristocracy, and was presented to the Queen, to, uh, presented at court, I should say, in 1920. And William Brandt, he moved to Shanghai and opened this firm, Brandt and Rogers. So my point here is that Edith was born on the China coast and part of the multi-generational China coast family. And the people she tended to associate with, or form alliances with, or relationships with, they're also members of multi-generational China coast families, like the Brands. So together, these families, they form a sort of network of people, of foreigners, who are brought up on the China coast and who have never really traveled to Britain or to Europe. So while she was living with William Brandt, Edith had two more children, two sons, uh, Roland and also Henry. Although Brandt, he denied that he was the father of the children and he forced Edith to register these children as British subjects under the name of her husband at the British consulate. But in 1916, William Brandt, he seems to have become tired of Edith, and so he buys her and her children a ticket to Hong Kong to get rid of them and forces them to leave. So she relocates again, this time to Hong Kong, the place where she was born. And because she had very limited skills and limited education, she found it very hard to find work in Hong Kong. But she eventually found some work teaching Japanese residents English. And in the course of these lessons, she also learns Japanese, which becomes very useful later on. Interestingly, Edith notes when she is writing here in a letter about her time in Hong Kong, she notes that she sent her children to schools in Hong Kong. It's hard to read her handwriting, but she says she has these three children they have all been educated in a British school for non-Eurasians. So she's implying here that her children are Eurasian, they are mixed race, but she has been able to send them to a school for non-Eurasians in Hong Kong. And she writes, all of my children are fair, so I pass them off easily. So in other words, she is saying that they don't look as if they have any Chinese heritage, and because people don't know about their parentage in Hong Kong, um, she's able to send them to schools which are supposed to be only for white children. So she shows this interesting awareness of the uh, racial inequalities in Hong Kong and how she can get around them in this letter. So thinking about her travels so far, Edith began her life in Hong Kong. She was then brought up in, in Hankou, mainly. And she also spent time in Shanghai. And she moves around between these three places. But while she's in Hong Kong, she meets her second and her third husbands. So it seems as if she married another British man named Moore. But he died very soon after their marriage. But fortunately, or unfortunately, she very soon finds a third husband. And this husband's name is Waller. If I just go back to the slide with all the names, this man. So he is her third husband. And together with him, they move to Japan. So again, she makes another journey, another migration. 
And whilst in Japan, Edith and her new husband, they travel around between various Japanese treaty ports, especially between Kobe and also Yokohama. And she's able to do this because she draws upon a network of family and friends in these places. She has a paternal uncle, the brother of her father, who lives in Kobe, and he gives him some assistance until he dies, and then the assistance, the assistance stops. But things start to go very wrong for Edith while they're in Japan. Uh, firstly, her new husband becomes addicted to drugs. Uh, as she describes him as a dope fiend, so he's addicted to morphia, or heroin, as we might say in the present day. And as a result, he starts spending all of their money and mistreating her and her children. And at the same time, it turns out that the Edith and her husband, they have been living for free in various hotels around Japan. So they would go to a hotel and they would stay in a hotel for a few weeks. And they would eat there for free, and then they would just run away and leave without paying the bill. So they had done this many times, so they were being pursued by the Japanese police for non-payment of their bill. And it's at this point that Edith starts to come to the attention of the consular authorities in Japan. And the consul, the British consul in Kobe, starts to get involved in her case and starts writing back and forth with the Shanghai consul about what to do with her. By January 1923, the Edith and her husband had been caught by the Japanese police and they were placed in prison for fraud and for embezzlement. Again, there's an interesting twist here with regard to Edith's children because it came to the attention of the British consul that Edith had apparently sold her daughter, Constance, to a Japanese cafe owner and this had, this had caused quite a lot of consternation among the foreign community in Yokohama because the, the spectacle, the sight of a 12-year-old British girl working in a Japanese cafe, it had raised all these anxieties about white slavery and abuse and so forth. So at this point, the British consul gets involved and he arranges to take Edith's children away from her and to send them back to Shanghai and put them in the care of a Catholic orphanage. And this happens in January 1924. So things don't really get better for Edith, they actually get worse. Their children have been taken away from her and after she is released from prison in Japan, she wants to go back to Shanghai where she has more friends and family, but she doesn't have any money to get there. So she forms another alliance, another relationship, this, this time with a Korean man who she meets in Japan. And so they go back to Shanghai together, but they are very quickly arrested for swindling a hotel in Shanghai. They do the same thing, they stay there and then run away without paying the bill. And so she's placed in the Amoy Road Jail in Shanghai. And then she's released from prison once again, but she very soon commits another crime uh, this time she goes into the International Bank in Shanghai and she asks for them to give her a checkbook and says that she will deposit some money into the bank account later that afternoon. But of course she never deposits the money into the bank account and instead she goes on this big shopping spree with her Korean friend writing all these checks even though she doesn't have any money. So she is sent to prison once again. She's also suffering from increasing ill health at this point and experiences about four heart attacks in the space of six months. And all of this ends with a permanent separation from her children because in April of 1926, the British Supreme Court for China rules that Edith permanently lose custody of her children who are now wards of the church. So they're now placed in the care of the Catholic Church forever. So what became of Edith? Uh, the last thing that I can find out about her is that after 
after she was released from prison, she was sent to the Foreign Women's Home in Shanghai, which was this charitable institution that was set up to help destitute foreign women. And she only stayed there for a short time because she stole a fur coat from one of the other residents of the home. And therefore, she ran away, at this time, to the port of uh, Wuhu. So she moves to another treaty port where she presumably has some friends. And the last thing I've heard about her is that she found a job as a companion for an invalid, for a very sick person in Tianjin, and was planning to accompany that person to Britain. But we don't know if she ever actually arrived in Britain. If she did go to Britain, then it's likely that she never saw her children again. Uh, they had become true orphans of empire, stranded in the treaty courts. So what can the story of Edith Brentnell tell us about life and work in the treaty courts? I think, first of all, it draws attention to the very complicated identities of many foreigners living on the China coast. Edith Brentnell was born in Hong Kong, and she was brought up in various treaty courts. So she might have been a foreigner in terms of her nationality, but the treaty courts were all she knew. She had never traveled to Britain, or even outside of this uh, arena of the Chinese and Japanese treaty courts. And she's very deeply embedded in the personal and family networks of these court cities. She draws upon the help of her uncle in Kobe, in Japan. Uh, she draws upon the help of the various men that she marries or forms relationships with. And also on a vast range of family friends who I didn't mention in this brief summary. So she uses these connections to constantly move around between the treaty ports. So she might not have made international journeys, long distance journeys, but she was very mobile within this world of the treaty ports. They form this integrated zone of opportunity for marriage and work and crime for women like Edith. I also think that the multiple identities that she assumes throughout her life, they can highlight the very cosmopolitan nature of the treaty ports. The people that she associated with had multiple nationalities. They were German, British, American, Japanese, and Korean, and sometimes an uncertain mixture of many of those things. And Edith herself claimed to be either British or American at different points in her life. Uh, and partly this was to avoid prosecution and arrest, but it was also uh, partly, uh, partly it also shows that she was very genuinely confused about her own national identity. And secondly, I think that Edith Brednell's life story, and particularly the story of her children, it tells us something about this perceived problem of children and childhood among foreign communities in China. Edith's children were very forcibly taken away from her by the British authorities. And although she wrote to inquire about them, she never saw them again, probably. And this very extreme action, it speaks to this growing worry, a growing anxiety among the foreign elite in the treaty courts about people who were born in China, about the second and third generation China-born foreigners. There was a great stigma attached to this population. They were considered to be, um, to not fit in with respectable society. And central to this concern was the idea that children could be very easily corrupted by the cosmopolitan environment of the treaty courts, that they would have too much contact with Chinese culture, but also with the immorality of the treaty courts like Shanghai. And because they had no contact with the British environment, they didn't properly know their nationality. And these people, they also had very few skills and often a low education, and so they were considered to be embarrassing by treaty court elites. And as a result, what we see is that 
in the early 20th century, children who were born in China, especially mixed race children, are increasingly institutionalized. So they're placed in the care of orphanages, like the Catholic orphanages I mentioned, or in boarding schools, such as the, the Thomas Hanbury School, which was originally established for Eurasian or mixed race children in Shanghai. So this was a way of removing children from this dangerous environment and putting them into a British environment. And one other thing that I think that this, this case highlights is how so-called China-born people, this is the phrase that was used to refer to foreigners who were not born in Europe or America, um, they had no clear nationality or identity and often they have quite difficult lives as a result. Thinking about the British case, uh, British nationality could only be passed down to one generation at this point in time, for children born overseas. And this meant that Edith's children, even though Edith was British, she could not pass on her nationality, and her children therefore didn't have any nationality, and so they were not entitled to a British passport but they were also not considered to be Chinese subjects by the Chinese government. So this means that they were stuck, really, in the treaty ports. And this isn't an example of Edith's child, but this is a similar example. This is a letter from a boy, Richard Artingdale, who's from a third generation of the Coast family. And he was 17 when he wrote this letter. And he's writing it to the British consul asking for a passport. And he notes that he has a British grandfather who lives in England. And he ends by saying, I depend a lot on getting a passport, as I do not intend to stay in Shanghai all my life. But the fact was that he was not considered to be British. And so he did not get his passport, and probably he did end up staying in Shanghai all his life. These people were orphans of empire uh, who did not have any kind of nationality or protection. Okay, so the third and the final story I want to tell is perhaps the most dramatic in a way. And this is a story of a collaborator, Lawrence Clint Kentwell. And he was a lawyer, he was a revolutionary, he was a collaborationist, and just an all-round notorious person. And I think the Kentwell's life story, it raises several questions. Uh, firstly, it emphasizes the very complicated identities of Eurasians, of mixed-race people in China and the British Empire. And it also emphasizes China's integration into global networks of travel, education, and professional migration. So again, I want to go through his life story to illustrate these points. Uh, Kentwell, like many of the people I've mentioned, he was born in Hong Kong. Um, his birthday is often, I've seen it referenced as being in 1876 or in 1882, but I think 1876 is the most likely date. Um, especially because he had a younger brother who was apparently born in 1881. <clears throat> and his beginnings were quite inauspicious. He was born on a boat in Victoria Harbour, just out there behind this building. And his father was British and the captain of the boat on which he was born. And his mother was Chinese. But again, we don't know her name because the names of Chinese women who were married to British men are usually not recorded in the archives. Now, it seems as if his father either left Hong Kong or died a few years after his birth because at some point in the 1880s, the Kentwell brothers and their mother emigrated to Hawaii and they moved to Honolulu. It's probable that his mother married an American and therefore moved to Hawaii. And in Honolulu, 
Campbell seems to have lived a fairly privileged life. He very clearly identified as being British in this time period, so he didn't seem to reference his Chinese heritage very much. He attended Oahu College in Honolulu, which was an elite college at this point in time. Actually, this is the college that Barack Obama attended, so there's a nice connection there to contemporary politics. And after he graduated from this college, well, in his graduation speech, he talked about how great the British Empire was and how wonderful Queen Victoria was. So he seems to really clearly see himself as being British at this point. Uh, he then worked as a real estate broker, and in 1901, he got married, and he married a woman named Annie Kailakanoa Holt. Uh, she was from a very prominent native Hawaiian family, so the family were partly British, partly uh, native Pacific Islander. And I couldn't find a photo of her, so here's a photo of her father, the man seated in the middle, Colonel John D. Holt, who was one of the, the members of Queen Ilio Kalani's staff. She was the, the Queen of Hawaii until the American annexation in 1898. So things are going quite well for Lawrence at this point in time. But the issue of his Chinese heritage began to rear its head when he tried to run for political office in 1902. And his opponents claimed that he had obtained his American citizenship fraudulently because this was the time of the Chinese exclusion laws in North America, the laws introduced in 1882, which made it almost impossible for Chinese migrants to gain American citizenship. At this point, he also began traveling very widely. And in the course of these travels, he began to become more aware. He experienced a sort of racial awakening or epiphany. And this was because in the course of his journeys, it became very apparent that Kentwell's mixed race, Eurasian identity, and his ability to culturally cross between the overseas Chinese community in Hawaii and the upper middle class white community could both ease and also obstruct his journeys. So just to recap, he's already made a quite a big migration from Hong Kong to Honolulu. But then in the first few years of the 20th century, he makes a lot of other journeys. He goes back to Asia, to Manila, to Singapore. He also goes to London. Uh, he probably stops off at various other places along the way. And he comes back to Honolulu via New York. And later on, he claims that he was actually working as Sun Yat-sen's secretary. And that's why he made all these journeys. But I'm, I'm still not sure whether that's true or whether it's something that he made up to make himself seem more important as possible. <clears throat> now, again, this is the time of the Chinese exclusion laws in America, which barred Chinese immigration. And so during the course of these journeys, um, Lawrence Kentwell, he increasingly, increasingly came across these barriers to Chinese immigration. He noted that when he traveled to New York in a first class cabin and wearing a Western style suit with a British passport and speaking with his American accent, he could quite easily get through the immigration checkpoints. The immigration officers thought he was European. But when he traveled to his hometown of Honolulu, where his associations with the Chinese community were well known, he had a lot of hassle, a lot of trouble getting into the city. And he commented that he was treated like a common criminal and humiliated and questioned in front of his fellow passengers. And so this sparked a year-long long campaign where he wrote to the Department of Labor in America trying to appeal against the Chinese exclusion laws, but of course it didn't work. He then also began traveling for his education. So he went to Columbia University in New York where he studied for a law degree. 
and then later on he studied for another law degree, this time at Oxford University, and he seems to have done quite well in Oxfordshire and practiced as a lawyer for several years after he gained his degree. And then in 1916 he made his final big migration, this time back to Shanghai. And I should also note that by this point, Lawrence Campbell has six children with his wife, and they're pictured here in this charming picture that I recently obtained from uh, Lawrence Campbell's great niece. So, oh no, I'm sorry, not from his niece, from his granddaughter. So he had one son. Uh, this is a little boy, not a girl, as you might think. And his son has several children, and I've recently been in contact with one of those children who has given me some of these very nice family photographs to use. His family relocated with him to Shanghai. And in Shanghai, he seems to have done very well for a few years. He worked as a lawyer at the British Supreme Court. And he was seemingly, on the surface, a established member of the elite treaty for British community. But privately, he was becoming increasingly aware of the racism of treaty port society. And for instance, he wrote about the Shanghai Club being a home of racial prejudice and arrogance. And this conviction that treaty port society was intolerably racist, it came to a head in 1926 when he was disbarred from working as a lawyer in Shanghai. And the reason given was that he had been forging money. So he was forging banknotes, apparently. And also he had registered a Chinese man at the Shanghai consulate, as a Shang uh, at the, at the Spanish consulate in Shanghai as a Spanish subject, so that that man could register his business as a Spanish business. But Lawrence Kedwell, he didn't believe that this was why he was disbarred. And he, believed it was instead due to the racial prejudice of the British community because he was Eurasian and because he was mixed race. And so this sparked a 10 year long campaign where he campaigned against the racism of the British Empire and treaty port society. And he did this in two bilingual Chinese and English newspapers that he set up, the China Courier and the Canton Sun Daily. And both of these newspapers were very critical of the British establishment and also supportive of the Kuomintang, the Nationalist Party. Another thing that made him very upset with the British authorities is that he had lots of Eurasian friends in Shanghai. He associated with many uh, Eurasian acquaintances. And increasingly in the 1920s, the British government was taking away the passports of Eurasians. And this is just one example. This isn't Lawrence Kettle's friend, but it's an example of a passport application that was rejected because of the British consular establishment's uh, new crackdown on people who they thought should not be British. And this is the passport application of a woman named Linda Beale, who had previously been registered as a British subject, but then is struck off the register in 1931 when she applies for a passport renewal. So this is another thing that made him very angry at the British. And he also launched this poison pen campaign against the judge at the Supreme Court who had struck him off the register. So this is just one example that I quite like where he writes, my ambition in life is to be your hangman. I want to be a hangman to hang a corrupt and biased judge, signed by Lawrence Clint Kentwell, your official hangman. <laughs> so I think the message there is very clear. <laughs> now, all this culminated in Lawrence Kentwell renouncing his British nationality in 1931. So he declared he no longer wanted to be British and gave up his passport. And probably the British consul was quite relieved when this happened. But now that he wasn't British, what was he? Because he also wasn't eligible to be registered as a Chinese subject under Chinese nationality law. So he didn't have a nationality now. He was stuck in Shanghai. And 
It seems as though his dream of becoming a Chinese nationalist and gaining acceptance with the Chinese political community, it didn't really happen. It wasn't fulfilled. So he became increasingly unenamored with the Chinese political community too. And his story ends with collaboration. During the Second World War, he became a collaborator with the Japanese puppet authorities working in their propaganda departments. Uh, he also published another newspaper in which he expressed admiration for Hitler and for Mussolini and for fascism in general, as well as support for the Japanese occupation. So this meant that after the war ended, he was, he was charged with treason and placed on trial and sentenced to life in prison for his actions during the war. And the last thing that we know of with Cloris Kedwell is a newspaper report in the Chinese press in 1946 where he is making an appeal to be released on medical grounds because he has some sort of a brain disease. And it's probable that he died just a few months after this appeal in prison. So he had a very dishonorable end in many ways, but it's worth noting that his children actually did very well. They don't seem to have suffered from the taint of their father's collaboration. And in fact, I recently realized that his son, Larry Holt Kentwell, he's the, the little boy, the smallest child on the picture I showed you, he actually had a very illustrious career in the foreign service and the colonial service, and he ended his career in Hong Kong as the Deputy Director of the Social Welfare Department in 1971. Uh, so in many ways the family came full circle, starting in Hong Kong and making all these journeys, first to Hawaii, and then to New York, to England, and then of course he made many other journeys to lots of other places in between, but they ended up back in Hong Kong. So what does Kenwell's story tell us about the treaty ports? Well, once again, it shows us how China is integrated into these networks of professional opportunity and education and migration. But also, it tells us, I think, about some of the prejudices and the privileges that accompanied a mixed-race Eurasian identity. Kenwell was a very confident person, and he was also very wealthy. And so he was able to sometimes get around barriers to Chinese immigration in the United States and in other places. But he also increasingly faced problems when he was making these journeys. He came up against immigration officials who would not let him in the country. Um, in America, this was because of his Chinese heritage, but when he traveled to other parts of the British Empire, like Singapore, he was increasingly barred from entering. He was on the blacklist because of his anti-British propaganda. So his journeys are more and more constricted. And again, it shows how many Eurasians in the treaty port world, they had very complicated identities. And this cosmopolitan world enabled them to test out different identities. Lawrence Kentwell began his life as a British subject, and then he tried to be an American, but he failed at being an American. So then he tried to become Chinese, but this failed too. So he ended his life collaborating with the Japanese, partly as a result. Eurasians never quite fit within this society. So some brief conclusions, bringing together these three quite different stories, I think draw some, some general points from them. Uh, firstly, I think that these stories, they tell us about the mobility and immobility of different types of people in the treaty ports. On the one hand, the China coast was integrated into all of these networks of travel and migration and work, and so many of the people who lived there were very mobile. They made these quite big journeys at a time when travel was not very easy. But also people were increasingly becoming immobile because of changes in nationality laws and changes in the availability of passports and new barriers to immigration. 
I think it also raises questions about who exactly was a foreigner on the China coast. Because, as hopefully will be clear, many of the members of the foreign community, they were born in the world of the China coast. They often never traveled to other places. So in a way, they are natives of China, just different, and they have a different cultural experience. I think it also raises questions about the success and failure of different foreigners on the China coast. Because often when we think about foreign communities, we think about tales of success and of gaining a lot of wealth and a higher status. And those stories are, of course, very true, but also there are other stories of people who tried and failed to exploit these opportunities of the treaty ports. And very lastly, I think these three stories tell us how in this charged environment of the treaty ports, personal and private lives, they can very, very easily become political. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed hearing about these three stories, and I thank you again for listening to the lecture, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have about the people that